This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Here is another Beyond the Big Screen teaser for episodes coming soon. I hope you enjoy and definitely tune in for future episodes. If you want to learn more, you can head over to beyondthebigscreen.com. You can also send me an email to steve at a2zhistorypage.com or follow us on social media by searching for A2Z History. I will see you next time beyond the big screen. How is powerless at this point? And so like what happens, What? how do humans act when they're powerless? And he's acting just like a human would. Um, and I remember I've seen this in theaters a couple times. I, like every time someone's like, "Yeah, we're putting we're putting 2001 up on the on the big screen," I'm going. And um, and every time I've seen it just with another person, like me and one other person in the dark, we are dead silent through that entire scene. But every time I see it with audiences, people laugh. And every time Hal says something, every time Hal says something, people laugh. Um, and it actually reminded me of another Nietzsche book, Birth of Tragedy, where like where it's it's the tension is so high that like in this collective group, we're actually not able to sustain it um, because Hal is so desperate. And we're so like we we start to connect with Hal. Now he's a murderous, rampaging AI, but all of a sudden we feel his fear and his agony and agony and his anguish. And, and so these, these audiences, we actually like laugh because we can't sustain that tension in a bunch of other people. It's just too much. It's too intimate. It is too intimate for us to, to be able to fully experience it in a big group of people. And so people, you know, when, when Hal is saying, I've made a terrible mistake, Dave, and I'm very sorry, people, people laugh and it's absurd, but, but I think that was intentional. Um, because it's just too much for us. And that's how human Hal is in some ways, not in the same way as the replicants who are like, who are very familiar human. Hal is still in the uncanny Valley. He's still, he's still weird and we don't like him. Right. But we do feel empathy for his fear of death. And Oh God, it's, it's just so good. It's so well done. I almost wonder if that whole third act was set up as a way, as almost like this, that outside force, the monolith of putting, uh, uh, and uh, how Hal went on down to just Dave versus Hal. If who's going to go through this focal point of civilization and to go to the next level, you know, that these two different, these two different entities have been have evolved to this point the the ai the computer are they better than the human they both can't pass through the point who's going to be the one to win i didn't even think about that but it's just the apes all over again isn't it yeah kind of wow yeah i didn't even tie yeah i mean it really is these two (laughs) bands fighting each other and the one who succeeds is going to is going to get the opportunity to keep going and the other one is going to die Right. Which is implied from 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 act one. Right. Like, of course, the apes who figure out how to use like stone tools, like they're eating better. They can beat the crap out of the other apes. Yeah. That other band of apes is dead. They will not pass their genes on. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. And the, the, like the final showdown between Dave and Hal, like one of them is going to continue and one of them will perish. We had tried to fly that. There was a disaster coming down the road. It was going to be a disaster somewhere. If it hadn't been that fire, we likely would have lost the crew in space. Several of the astronauts said that later. So we would, and if we had continued to fly it, there might have been two or three disasters. Uh, we definitely wouldn't have made Kennedy's deadline without the redesign. And my position is we might not have made it at all because you realize most people don't realize this. There were there was considerable opposition in the country to what we were doing. 
the costs involved. People think, oh, the whole country rallied around NASA. Well, everybody was excited when we landed on the moon. But before that, public opinion polls, there were a, there's a large segment of people that didn't want to do it, thought it was a waste of money. We ought to be putting it in schools and cleaning up the slums and that kind of thing. Social programs, a lot of liberals in Congress were not in favor of it. So there's opposition. And after the fire, that opposition actually rose to a majority. There was a poll in July of 1967 that showed that 54% of Americans thought the cost was too high in terms of money. And now that we've lost three guys, uh, why are we doing this? So losing a crew in space rather than on the ground might would have been enough to finish it off. Again, that's, again, that's speculation, but with the you know, public opinion polls. Of course, I think what saved NASA was the fact that there were so many other problems in the 1960s, right? Vietnam's going on, it's getting worse every day and people's attention span went somewhere else. And it gave NASA time because they closed the program for two, almost two full years while they did this. You know, it kind of faded out of the, out of the limelight and people were concerned about other things and they, you know, they went to work. They said, we're gonna, we're gonna continue this on. We're not gonna have these guys die in vain because all three of them had said the same thing in interviews before the test. Um, hey, if we die, that's just part of it. This is our business, Roger Chaff. He said, we, we're test pilots. This is what we're doing. And these are brave, brave men to do things like that. We're very fortunate to have had them. So they wanted it to continue and NASA wanted it to continue as well. So they just rolled up their sleeves, went to work and moved, moved it forward.